The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey guys, it's Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at Ensemble and founder of financial advice company Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby I started from scratch a little bit over seven years ago. In that time, I've leveraged some of the learnings of the Ensemble community to scale the business to become one of the better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators in Australia. And through this podcast, you can join me each Tuesday as I have the absolute privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'm going to selfishly be able to learn and continue my journey to improve every area of my advice business. Hopefully, you can learn a few things on that journey as well. Jump over to Ensemble.com and if you haven't already signed up to learn and share from others or simply download the app. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the Ensemble team. And today I'm uh, very pumped to be here with uh, the man with the plan, Phil Thompson. When I say plan, I mean top knot. Uh, Phil <laughs> is the financial advisor and founder of Sky Wealth, uh, based out of the great state of Victoria. Phil, great to have you, mate. Hey, thanks for having me, Nashi. Good to be here. Mate, I thought uh, a good place to start is is really just your advice journey and, and how you've ended up where you are today. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so I got into advice around 2011, I think, around about then, 2011, 2012. And um, early on, I, I earned an advice business. So um, the, the advisor I was working for exited pretty early for me getting in and I just took the plunge and, and took over the business, um, which was um, fun, interesting, a whole bunch of learnings there. Um, and then... Early on, I was AFA Rising Star nominee alongside yourself and a few other good friends of ours oh, um, back in, I don't know, 2013, 14 or whenever that was. Um, and so that's when we first met. And then have, did holistic advice for quite a number of years, for like eight years, and then was getting a little bit frustrated with advice, the thought on oh, maybe I'll get out or um, just saw the writing on the wall. And, and my view on advice was that, you either need to go real high end market, so ultra high net worth, worth clients, or you need to focus on one thing and and do that one thing really well. And so my kind of desire and passion is to work with you know clients just like myself, you know average average Australian average income. Um, and so I saw that kind of you know one of the only ways to do that, well not the only way, but but I found that a good way to do that was to move into insurance helps people make a really difficult financial decision, um, which insurance is, and we can do it at, at a low cost to um, so the client. Um, because the alternative was you got to charge really high fees to, to add value um, and to, to you know execute the services that advisors need to do. So that's what we did. 2019, kind of 2020, we, didn't, we don't work with any clients other than insurance only clients. Mm. And what did you do with your white clients? Uh, yeah, so we, we partnered with another advice firm um, actually up in, in Brisbane um, because there was a bit of time where we went insurance only for new clients and we were managing the existing clients and it just got too difficult. I realized that uh, it was a little bit unfair on the clients to kind of not, um, we you know, I was still servicing them and still helping them, but if that wasn't my future, then maybe it's not fair on the clients. And, and I kind of realized that, you know, as much as I think the clients love me and, you know, and we, and you know, I'm important in this relationship. At the end of the day, it's, it's whatever best for them. And so that's why we moved into just um, partnering with another firm in, in Brisbane um, and who were setting up an office in Melbourne. And so yeah, we they work with, with our old clients now. And it's and it's best for the clients, best for us, and best for the, for the new business as well. 
And so what's been the impact of, of that change on business, business growth, team growth? Like what did you, what did your business look like then? And what does it look like now? Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the business then looked crap and the business now looks like good. Um, so one of the, one of the big learnings and, and look, I wish I did it much sooner. Like the reason we did it is, you know, I saw, you know, another thing is in, in the advice space, you know, insurance advice, there's fewer advisors wanting to do it revenue would drop with regards to commissions and so it was really difficult um kind of space and i thought if i come in and try and um put a lot more kind of emphasis on the clients executing a lot of the tasks um and we kind of share that burden of getting insurance in place we can make it a a much more efficient business so we've grown like significantly since we were doing like i was trying to pretend to be an advisor back in the day and, and had like two staff and now we've got you know, over 25 staff in the team and plenty, plenty of clients. I kind of wish I did it much sooner because the benefit is we know exactly who we work with and we know exactly the people who should be working with us. Back in before, it was kind of a little bit gray. Oh, I'm a financial advisor. I can help in A, B and C. But if you want A and B, we can kind of do that. If you want C and D, we can kind of do that. And so we were really clearly articulating exactly who we work with and who should work with us. But now it's very, very simple and easy what we do. Mm. Oh yeah, I think there's a lot of obviously different ways to to do advice, but I would agree with you that over time, like where we're seen to be heading is that people are either you're an investment specialist, you're an insurance specialist, you're a business owner specialist, or you're um, a planning specialist. But a planning specialist needs to sort of cater for people that can pay an appropriate fee for a good quality planning service, which is you know is now significant such that as you say it does sort of cut out a lot of the the average income type um australians it's they are probably priced out i'm hopeful maybe they can't uh obviously won't be able to see my fingers crossed on the the uh, audio recording but um that this qar stuff is gonna move the dial a little bit but i think we'll continue to see advice businesses play more in the um, higher value, higher fee space, and it means that there is a a, a large market that are probably not um, not getting serviced as well. Tell us when you when you think about starting an insurance only business, essentially almost from scratch, even though you did have an existing business. How did you actually? How did you tackle that? How did you figure out what you do, what you wouldn't do, what you do differently, and how it would roll? Uh, ch- changing all the time, uh, and still still changing, uh, which is the beautiful thing. So. Um, we kind of, I kind of just delved into it head first and we, you know, the last, you know, holistic client I worked with, I charged, you know, 20, 30% above what I should, should have charged or what I, what I normally charge. And they still said yes. And I still regretted doing it. And I still like, you know, procrastinated and found other things I wanted to do. But so that was kind of the real, the, the, the last, um, advice client, um, that wasn't just pure insurance. So when we moved to insurance only, um, we just kind of just started solving problems and going, okay, what what's some issues? So we, you know, originally we weren't charging a fee at all. So we would say, hey, we will do a, a rough guide, a proposal for you to kind of go, this is roughly how much cover we think you need and roughly the cost and here maybe the terms. And then we did a lot of work and we kind of built that out where we, okay, as a part of that, we would do a pre-assessment. And then from that kind of proposal to the statement of advice, we would, um, you know, get the clients to commit. Hey, if you if we do the advice and then you pull out, we'll charge your fee. But we still weren't charging a fee um, up until then. And then we realized at that proposal stage, we actually did most of the work to, to advice. We actually pretty much were getting everything ready and doing all the research to provide advice, full pre-assessment, full quote analysis and everything. So I just was like, why don't we just give advice then? Um, which we did, and then um, and then we started charging for that and going. Well, there's a huge amount of value here, whether they go ahead or not. It's you know it's not up for us to you know decide for the client. They'll decide for themselves. So you know we've moved to a stage where today what we do is we do a 15 minute phone call with the clients um, just to give them an idea of what we do and just to really help them understand that we're only doing insurance advice. So if they indicate, oh maybe I want help with super, cool. We're not the right firm for you to work with you know we'll, we'll refer you on to someone who's kind of more suitable and then um so that 15 minute phone call we understand and then and then we charge them a fee um so it's you know we charge 330 dollars for individuals and 495 dollars for couples 
for a, we, we still call it an insurance proposal, but it's a statement of advice. And then, um, yeah. And then from there, they either go ahead as we tell them to, they change the quote if they want to, or they choose not to, to go ahead with any of the cover. And then, so if they do proceed with taking up the insurance, then you just take the commission on the policies and there's no further fee at that point. Is that right? Yeah, there is a little asterisk. So we do say, hey, if we if you sign off and say you want to go ahead and then we do a whole bunch of work and then you pull the pin, at the end of the day, you don't have to go ahead with it. But we've done more work, we'll charge you a fee for that. And so that's in the the advice where we say individuals at $750 um, once off cost if they go ahead and, and pull the pin. So, you know, it's only three reasons that we charge that. So reason number one, they just decide not to proceed after signing off on on the advice. Uh, reason number two, they get declined for anything we don't know about. So they've, you know, haven't told us about drug use and go and tell the insurance company about drug use. Well, we did extra time. We ask you the questions. We charge your fee. Or if they cancel their policy and, and the commissions are clawed back. So there, there is an asterisk. I've charged it like five times in, you know, 1,200 clients that we've, that we've worked with. So we almost never charge it. Um, but yeah, now our standard process, 330 for individuals, 495 for couples, and then the commissions on it. I'm just, I'm just trying to do some mental maths around those, um, those numbers there because you just mentioned that you've done it with 1,200 clients and you started doing this in 2019. So how many, how many clients are you guys typically onboarding on whatever cadence makes the most sense for you to think about? Uh, well, yeah, I, mean, I thought you were going to ask me this question. I looked, so at the end of the financial year, what we did is we did a report that we sent back to the insurance company and say, hey, this is where our business is going and here's the issues we're finding with you. If we're doing heaps of business, great, but there's still things that we'd love to see improved. Mm. And if we're not, I think we, we place, what was it, five, just just less than 550 uh, individuals last year. Well, wow. so like a couple, if they both got insurance, that'd be two people. That's yeah. a huge number. And how many frontline advisors do we have? Uh, so at the moment, we've got um, three advisors. Um, we've got a PY as well, as a professional year as well. Um, and we're trying to, to recruit another advisor at the moment. And so you mentioned that you mentioned a little bit earlier that one of the things that you do is get the clients to do a bit of the the more like some of the heavy lifting to make it a little bit more efficient from your end. What does mm. that look like? Yeah, so we do we get the clients to fill in the fact find on their own. So full fact find on their own um, via an online form, and then uh, and it's and it's comprehensive. It's not just gives you you know income debt super balance um because we do a full pre-assessment off the back of that fact fine so we yeah, we get the fact fine completed by them on their own and you know we've got videos explaining you know why it's important and, and everything and they can email back and forward if they've got any questions but we're not there sitting there doing that we do tele-interview for every client so we don't do any personal statements um with the clients so some of that stuff um we it's not, look, it's not revolutionary. Most advisors would be getting their clients to do that stuff as well. But, you know, you talk to some advisors who will do like four, four meetings. Like like your business, you do a number of meetings, that, that's right? Well, yeah, well, we we do get the clients to complete their own fact find, but then we review that in detail and discuss it with them in detail. Not every point, but anything that we think needs to, to be clarified. We do that after, though, they've, they've signed on as a client and, and mm. you know, pay the deposit on our advice fees and, and that sort of yeah. stuff but yeah we don't necessarily sit with them to 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 do that um but yeah I mean, we, do, we, we do spend an hour and a half asking them questions before we go before we go into doing our bit of the work from that comes from that yeah 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 and i mean like you know we will still go back like if someone's got a bmi of 50 it's probably they've they've you know put the wrong number in because that's a really high bmi so we just you know tactfully go back and just it's not that bad. I thought you were fucking like the kid. Um, when it, cause so, so, some people, we had a client the other day who put in pounds and then and centimeters for the height and pounds okay. for the weight. And so BMI was massive. Everyone came back or oh, declined, declined. We had to just go back and say, hey, just, you know, is this correct? And she's like, oh, no, I put in pounds. Like, who puts in who uses pounds these days? How about my mom, I think. That's yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, we, we go back and, you know, there's heaps, there's, you know, we're, we're still in advice. There's heaps of work and going back and forth with clients. Um, but we, we try and make that that process as efficient as possible. Yeah. And obviously it's important and 
but get with insurance like you got to charge the fee i think people people respect that they appreciate it they take it more seriously they take their decision to engage in the process more seriously mm. for sure but also before they're before they're purchased and because as much as we like to think otherwise it is a bit of a grudge purchase you want to try and keep that as low as possible to get them until they can see what they're you know that they're going to get all the peace of mind that they want at and work. i mean look also from a from a client experience it's because we we genuinely say you've got three options after the meeting you take out everything we told you to you change to the quote or you don't go ahead with any cover and when they pay us a fee and and everyone in advice understands it's not we would go broke tomorrow if if no one took our cover because mm. there's no way we can make that profitable just on the advice on that that 495 for a couple yeah but at least it helps the client walk away without feeling like oh i kind of owe you something because you didn't i didn't pay your fee and you've done this work for me so i kind of owe you something so maybe i'll go ahead with insurance our clients if they don't want to get insurance we comfortably feel okay because well we still got paid for our work and they feel good walking away because there was a value exchange. I paid you money for this and I got this and I walk away. Um, and so it's actually good for both. The advisors not to feel like there's any kind of, you know, sale um, and the clients to feel comfortable with a genuine decision that they're comfortable with. Mm. And what's the, uh, you might not have this number or might not have a handy, but um, what proportion of the people that you do the proposal for end up taking up some level of cover? Do you know? Yeah, I'd love I'd, I'd love our CRM to give us better data. That's for sure. Um, but it, you know, anecdotally, it's probably you know seventy to eighty percent um, that that take that because I mean they're all they've all paid a fee to be told they all want insurance. Um, yes, one the paid us money to tell them where and what and how. So it is a big portion. But some people, you know, and it's it's reasonable. Um, maybe I don't do it just yet. Maybe I will come back in a year's time. Or you know, we get a lot of people who we work with who say no and then they come back later. Yeah, for sure. He pays, pays another fee again. So, like, What's like, the biggest guy in the first place? But that's a game. Yeah, I think. Well, it's obviously the market changes pretty quickly, so it sort of makes sense that you've got to redo the work. And I suppose people I mean, yeah. understand that. Also, the fact that I think that the premiums go up each year, it sort of keeps keeps a bit of an anchor point for people as well to know that you know the more it runs away, the more they're going to end up paying. They pay more. It's mm. not like just paying another three hundred thirty or four hundred ninety five bucks. It's they're going to pay. Yeah, yeah cover as well tell us what's um what's been the, the most challenging part of that the not so much the transition but you know rolling out essentially a the insurance only solution and obviously now you got to the point where you're you know onboarding that amount of of clients you know in, in significant volume yeah what's been the biggest challenge in that for you um i mean efficiency is hard so um yeah, this is something that we're kind of working on and, and thinking about at the moment is, you know, we're working with all the insurers. We, we, we you know, we hate them all equally, um, the insurance companies. So we don't discriminate with insurers, but, you know, which means we're working with like 10 different companies and their processes and, and got to got to manage that. Um, but also, you know, insurance is a space like advice is very compliance driven. But within the investment space, you know, there is a matter of like if if someone in the team accidentally ticks, you know, a different the long Vanguard ETF within the investment portfolio, it's probably not going to make that much of an, a, an issue. You know, you find out a year later we invested in the wrong fund. All right, let's just fix it. Work out was there any performance difference, and you pay a check to the client for you know ten grand or twenty grand or whatever it is. With insurance. If we make a mistake and we cancel a client's policy for a million bucks and they're uninsurable, then then that's a million dollars that we're on the hook for. Um, so making sure we're an efficient business, but also with the right checks and balances. And I feel like over the, la- over the last little bit, maybe we've gone too far in the checks and balances mm-hmm. and now our, our, our staff are experienced and, and understand what they're doing. We can kind of maybe scale back on, on the, you know, let's check this policy is in place correctly seven times. Maybe we can do it five times. Um, <laughs> so, like, so I feel like, yeah, how do we build efficiency without any downside to the client experience or downside to kind of, you know, making sure we don't make any mistakes? Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Man. Obviously, there's a lot that goes into it, um, a lot of things to, to check as well. How because did, did you have an offshore? You got a big offshore team now. Did you have a? Did you have those uh, the same team members when you started this journey, or is that something that you build out with the insurance piece? 
Yeah, we 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 didn't have a big um, offshore. I mean, we didn't. Have, I didn't have a big team. Full stop. Um, it was a baby business basically, um, and so we've kind of grown um, pretty significantly in the last twelve months. Really, um, I felt like last year I was just interviewing people and <laughs> just onboarding people. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's just been about like how do we grow and learn and change on a consistent basis. That's really what I've tried to learn and. Um, but yeah, onboarding people and training people is is really hard. What's your What's your top tip re re offshore team onboarding in particular? Um, oh, top tip uh, <clears throat> for me, like we we think about when my business, I think about like um, how do we just build systems and processes? Like one of the things that is great about doing one thing is like the list of things to improve doesn't get smaller, but it just gets narrower. So, you know, if, if you're doing, you know, a lot of different things for clients, it's so hard to fix, oh, how do we fix our mortgage broking, you know, process in this little area? Or how do we help our investment implementation team fix that? Like the list is very wide and very long. Um, mm. But in our business, the, re- the list is very narrow, but massive in terms of what we can improve. So yeah. it's, it's good because we can build in a lot of processes like I read the book Systemology last year. Um, oh yeah, which is really good. Just kind of thinking about how do we build out better systems and really um, bring the team along that journey because we've got people who are experts in the team and they can help build out the system. So yeah. maybe that my, my top tip: read Systemology and follow some of it. Or all of it. <laughs> yeah, I think I I know. Like I'm a very process minded sort of person, and uh, <laughs> for for a lot of years, in fact, until just just recently i i did take on all of that stuff myself and uh it is you know as your business grows i think a number of systems and i think we're pretty streamlined with how we do things but it ends up being like a lot uh now we're at the point where people different people in the business own the different systems and it's Mm. a total game changer because when something needs to change or or be updated or refreshed then they do it and it doesn't sit on your list for you know months waiting mm. for for something to happen and end up uh, overwhelming as well so and then yeah that that was something that we we did last year we've got someone whose only job is business improvements and every every day anyone in the team can have ideas on how do we improve something and then three mornings a week we catch up to talk about what it is and we kind of agree like whoever's the stakeholder in the area that needs to be improved we kind of say, yeah, oh, yeah, let's do this. And this one person's job is to just implement it and and do it. And because that was the issue. It was all on me. Phil, we need to fix this. We need to fix it. Mm. Cool. Just get to the back of the line because everyone's got suggestions. Um, so, yeah, we've got one person whose only job is just to fix, you know, improve the business. That's an interesting role. How do you how do you hire for a role like that? Uh, we didn't. We hired for a different role and she was very, very good at it. And I was thinking about how do we how do we do this, and I've gone. You're good at doing this, um, so I want to basically that can be your only job is fix these little issues because I I just want to always be moving and improving. But it's it's gets as it gets bigger and the beast gets a bit bigger. You kind of can like I feel like oh I need to be a bit more cautious and thoughtful about these changes, and so but I still want to move quickly, and so that's why I've just got one person to implement it. And then also understand that the beast and as so we can chat about any change because any everyone in the business has got great ideas like like the best ideas because they're the ones doing it all day long oh, i've got no idea what most of the people do so i want them to come up with the ideas of how to improve it and think creatively and then just suggest it and then and then it kind of goes through this filter process and then we change it all the time is that an onshore role or an offshore role or an offshore yeah awesome yeah, so she—I mean, she came on to as our marketing and kind of, you know, CRM kind of expert. So they help us with our automations and stuff. Mm. And then, and then, you know, we had a chat and say, we, you know, if you could be, if you could do one thing long term, because as we grow, you start to hone into one area and be specialised in that one area. What would you prefer, marketing or or like operations and improvements? Um, and she said, yeah, operations, and you know, I geek out on that stuff, so that's what I want to do. And I said, perfect, that's yeah. what you do happy days yeah. that's one of the advantages i think of having a growing business and a growing team is that it does allow you that flexibility with with where someone wants to take their roles so there's mm. a lot of 
opportunities for different things you can be doing more of. So I know when we've been baking that into our our progression planning with the team, it's like they can just take it wherever makes the most sense for them, and it and it sort of gels. So uh, I mean, how, like, I've got a I've got a question for you about that. Like, how do you think about that when you've got team members saying, "Oh, I think I want to be here," but as a business owner. Like the business will probably prefer them there, and you see their skills working better in a different area. How do you manage that with those with those team members? Well, I, I think you've obviously got to make sure that the short term business needs are are met. So, you know, you bring someone into the business to do a particular role, but so that they obviously need to do that role until then that you don't need them to do that mm. role. But I think if people if people demonstrate capability and enthusiasm for doing a particular thing and they're good at it then great they they can add more value to the business by doing that way so we had like uh, tim in our team he joined the business as an associate he wanted to be wanted to be an associate wanted to be an advisor and he and then he had um he's right into systems and stuff as well and he's he came to me one day and said oh i think we could track the workflow better for our onboarding process through using monday.com and he goes this is what it looks like and he goes and by the way i've just i've put together this you know rough outline of what this could look like and i was blown away and like i'm a process guy as Mm. well and so he showed me that and i was like wow this is amazing like obviously there's a there's a skill set there so i said well great i said run with it let's let's do it and we he did and and we ended up using that approach and of work pretty well now we're not using it now because we've sort of leveled up our our crm since that time but that to me demonstrated capability and then um i started getting him involved in more things and then we had our practice manager was going on maternity leave we had a real need for that role to be filled and for me it's much easier to hire a not that it's easy but it is easier to hire an associate than it is to hire a um you know an operations manager Mm. and he'd already demonstrated that capability and had an understanding of the business so he just sort of slotted into that role and now he's absolutely crushing it and has you know been a total game changer for the way that we tackle what we do similarly our team leader worked at our team leader the first um offshore team member that we brought on she's now running the team like she's a team leader for, for the for the offshore team even though she's moved she was in the philippines she's now moved to canada now she's also she wants to do more on the on the operation side, um, and she's basically being like an implementation manager, running a bunch of client meetings because we recognised that there was that wasn't working the, the way that we wanted it to in the business. So she's doing more on that side. At the same time, though, sometimes people want to go down a particular path, and there's just not the ability to do that in in mm-hmm. business. And I think that if you you, you need to call that out. Um, and if there is a plan to get there over the over the not so short term, then you know you can work towards that. But yeah, uh, I, yeah I, I think like I find it interesting in our team. We've got we've got some team members who say, "Oh, I maybe want to do power planning long term," and I see their role in like you know client services and going, "Well, you'll be more valuable in to the business where you are. You're good at what you're doing, and I can see more growth for you in this area." So I think. Personally, I think, and like, you know, and, and your personal, you know, salary and everything like that is not going to increase over here, but but the idea that, oh, that's career progression for some people. And I personally am like, I think this is this is better career progression for you, um, you know, for, for all of those factors. I Yeah, those, those conversations are really interesting to go, you know, because there is this, you know, client services, then Paraplan as number, you know, as a step above. Um, mm-hmm. And my philosophy is, you know, within our business, like I kind of, you know, apologize to the advisors and say, look, one of the issues of being an advisor at Sky is you're not the hero. Um, like most advice businesses are, it's like the, the advisor to the pinnacle. They're the they're the the top dogs um, mm. of the of the business. But at Sky, the way we think about it is like the the junior client services officer is just as impactful in in doing what we do and and helps us do what we do. That they're really important. And so this kind of like outside thinking of like what is a hierarchy in a financial advice business and then mm. what what i feel like is best suited for them and the business and their career is kind of you know there is a little bit of a disjointedness and had, having these conversations is is really interesting i've had that same conversation with offshore team members wanting to move into power planner seats as well and as much as it is really unsaid i feel and we know that it's not the case i think it is 
driven in a large part by the fact that para planners get paid more money in the Philippines than non para planner employees on average. And I think given yeah. that their overall their their wages are you know relatively low, they're they're not um uh, you know like super affluent. I suppose from from an income perspective that we've had and like implementation team members and they go, oh, I want to do that. I'm like you might you're going to make the same money. And when they really yeah. understand that and believe it, then they go, okay, well yeah, like it's more yeah. of a um like you say that it's a level up thing but for us like we've got yeah that the, our implementation and they work at, you know we used to call them admin but they're now essentially implementation people that they're as important perhaps more important when it comes to you know the the business opportunity than the power plan oh, maybe not more important maybe just as important so yeah yeah it is this interesting yeah cure yeah staff and and managing you know what's good for them what's good for me what's you know and and also put, you know, I, I also think about how do I look outside of myself and go like, you know, people are going to automatically think I'm being selfish telling them I think this is in your best interest because mm. everyone's innately selfish. So, um, but how do I look outside myself and go, look, I actually do think like, and I, and I say it straight. I say you're paid better than, than what you will be over here. I can tell you that today. And I think it's best for you. The only benefit I can see you doing that is finding a job external from the sky. And and if that's why you want to do it, that's totally reasonable and it makes sense and we can move you in that area. But there is no benefit in terms of salary, in terms of within Sky, uh, other than you can tell a potential new employer, hey, I'm a para planner as well. I've got that skill and, and you become more employable. And mm. which which is a legitimate concern and you know, and everyone's got to think about, you know, where you know, even I do, I'm I'm the business, so I've got to think about where it's like, you know, if everything turned to crap, what what would I do? Sometimes, though, I think people just really want to do the work. Like we've got a young advisor that we put into a sales seat and he's crushing it in sales and relationship management in the business. And he, But he, I really want him to stay in sales, but he really wants to be an advisor. And so I'm like, I have to be supportive of that. So as much as I think he probably could earn more money, he could certainly add more value to the business. Um, he wants to go down. And that's, and yeah, it's just about understanding. Is, is your motivation because you want to do that work? If that's the case, great. But if your motivation is these external kind of made up factors, maybe we have a chat about it. Absolutely. What's um What's coming up for you, Phil? What are you What are you focused on now? Uh, continue to grow. We're just kind of doubling down. Um, really is is our aim. Like for for us, you know, there there is a, a continual trend for advice firms to get out of insurance. Less advisors are doing insurance. It's like, you know, we, when we caught up the other day and someone tried to pitch you a service, it was really an interesting conversation we were in. Um, and you're just like, well, we don't really do insurance. <laughs> um, yeah. Someone's trying to sell you an insurance product. Um, I think that's a big trend. Advisors are getting out of it. It's too hard. It's, it's very complex, high risk. And so we're just going all in on that space. And, and unfortunately, the, the ability for clients to get insurance advice is only diminishing. Um, and so I, I only see kind of, you know, upside in our business. Love it, mate. That's good to see you. I, my last question for you, and I'll put a caveat on this one, but it's the question is if you could go back and do one thing differently, what would it be other than getting into insurance and the advice sooner? Yeah, so, um, well, that's my answer. <laughs> um, so let me, let me have a think about it. What would I do different? Um, uh, I would be... I think when I first took over the business um, that I took over, I was I was very concerned about a whole bunch of things, um, like you know our clients going to leave, our, you know you know I've just spent a whole bunch of money that's not my money, someone else's money who lent it to me on a business. How do I secure this? And just being less worried about that and more thinking about like how do I just build a good business? How do I build processes? How do I actually grow and bring on new clients? That's the hardest thing about advice is not as hard any at the moment like. We're kind of living in a golden era where there's more clients than we can ever anyone can service. Um, mm. But back when I started, back in my day, it was I found it really, really difficult to to find new clients, um, and I was focused on things that weren't impacting that ability to find new clients. Because when you got clients, you'll solve the problems later. Yeah, the our business coach says the answer to all problems is more sales, mm. it's more more sales, more money more ability to solve pro- solve solve problems in different ways so yeah and that and that was the case for us when we just started really getting a lot of leads like that's why we just iterated so quickly it's because we had to like when you don't really have the clients and you try and solve the client experience before you got any clients like mm. it's so stupid 
what are you solving? You're just imagining this idea that clients will love you for this or not like you for this. And and we all did it. All all young advisors did it. We thought about our amazing solution before we even had a bloody client. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I think when you start doing volume, you immediately start seeing the the pressure points and what can we improve or what keeps coming up or what's a recurring issue. Uh, it's a good way to identify things. It's just, and then it's just resourcing. And if you, if you've got enough clients, then you can resource appropriately. If you don't, then you sort of can't as well. So yeah, correct. Mate, I love that. Thank you for, for sharing your, your insights. So, I, um, yeah, it's, it's great. It's great to see, see from the sidelines and, uh, yeah, mate. Thanks again. No worries. Thanks for having me.